the human heart can go the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now, when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul men ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. Where are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake, but will you wake for pity's sake? This is the emergence in our time of what we call a holistic world view. A realization that this earth of ours is a living, thinking creature, a living being. floating in a vast and endless ocean of life and divine thought. And the human being, man, is not, as was thought last century, an accident of chance natural selection but is part of a great design. In other words, we are beginning to realize that the whole of nature is a work of art, a work of design, and that the human being is truly an integral part of nature, the crown of nature, the point where nature becomes self-conscious and can think out into the ocean of divine thought. A point that can think God's thoughts again, can reflect living ideas. This is an absolute turn about in consciousness from what our great-grandfathers triumphantly thought that they had discovered, that man was a mere accident of chance, natural selection. And we could do what we liked with this world, that we, just as onlookers on nature, with the right to exploit nature for profit in any way that we wanted, could do what we like with it. And that's what's bringing disaster on the world now. And that whole picture is beginning to reverse itself. This is happening in our generation to see that <sighs> all are but parts of one stupendous whole whose body nature is, and God the soul, that was Alexander Pope. Wonderful. But he just puts it. And this is the great truth we're discovering. We grasp the spiritual world view, but this is not 
just so much theory. We grasp that humanity is a vast being, cosmic being, of which you and I and everyone else are cells. We think into the whole. We realize that we are not, as you said first, mere observers to nature, but that we are nature. We are that point in the divine design and work of art that is nature, that point which has become, achieved self-consciousness. And therefore is able to act into the wholeness. Now this is the turn about that's happening. We're truly realizing that we are parts of this whole and that everyone else is also a part. This is the game that we're at to try to understand it and uh, try to formulate it. But to recognize that this is not just a theory we're trying to get hold of, but that it's an immense event which is happening through us. Something is happening, that's the point, something is happening now. And an impulse is flooding through people and through society. An impulse towards wholeness, integration, oneness, waking up to all this that we see about us is all part of this stupendous whole of which we are also part. And that it's all alive. That everything is live and everything has meaning. We are that organ of nature through which the divine world can experience its own creation. It is as if the divine power, God himself, can come down into matter and look out of our eyes and see from the inside what nature is like. This is the most wonderful thought. Can you take this now? I am looking straight into your eyes. Not me, not my personality, but the divine in me. For we are realizing and grasping the idea that that in us which can say I, the being in us, is in fact a droplet of divinity. Take that idea. Anything that is God is of God. The droplet or spark of divinity is axiomatically immortal. Now, you see the implications there? Yes, I do. I've never thought of that. God, if you like, looks out of my eyes at you. But it's the same God in you that looks out of your eyes at me. Only the same God has a droplet, the droplet of him has run through other experiences. But as I look at you like this, and cut out personality, just look at the human eye <laughs> as a phenomenon. <laughs> I realize that the divinity in me is looking at the divinity in you, that we're both parts of the same thing, which being so, if I hurt you or insult you or deceive you in any way, let alone murder you, I'm in fact hurting myself. And therefore we actually discover ourselves as part of this oneness. And we therefore begin to change. You can't go on. Once you've seen this oneness vision, this holistic worldview, 
you cannot go on living on the basis of merely making a profit out of other people and using violence to do so is the object of life. And because people what? begin to change, therefore. He has a very important point to make. You can't prove these spiritual ideas to the logical, matter-bound, sense-bound intellect. You don't have to prove them. We are not asking anybody to believe anything. We're not talking doctrine that we're trying to impose on people. Nobody's doing that, or should not be doing that. We are exploring ideas. We are learning how to explore ideas. Remembering that these ideas are truly living beings, strands of the thought of God, absolutely alive. Thoughts are alive. The angelic world is God's thoughts, which can come alight in our minds. And therefore, I give you now this very important technique. Don't believe, but recognize that you possess the capacity to apprehend a thought for its very beauty. You all know the moments when suddenly one realizes, good Lord, what a beauty, oh how lovely. You can seize it out of the ether like that. Lovely thought. And I say to that, that constantly, try to get it in each lecture, you're not being asked to believe anything. You're being invited to think. We're being invited to explore the realm of living ideas. And uh, if you don't like these ideas, well, for goodness sake, drop them. I wouldn't argue with anybody about this. But if you can, if you can take them, don't believe it, but take the idea and learn to live with it and act as if it is true while reserving judgment, not believing or disbelieving. Uh, such an idea that we've touched, that the thing in you that can say, I, is a droplet of God and therefore imperishable. Well, we can't prove that to the rational scientific mind. But you don't need to. What you would do is to live it. Love and it you le lose nothing by that. And you become a much more courageous and tolerable and toler tolerant person. And, um, and the point is that these ideas are alive. It's really the doctrine of the living idea, that the ideas are living things, they are living beings. And um, therefore, if you take such an idea as this one, that you are a, a droplet of divinity, and see where it takes you to, live it, you're a more courageous, tolerable person altogether, and if it's true, it draws certainty to itself. So without ever having had to waste time on arguing about it or trying to believe. Or taking dogmas. Don't and believe, but act it as if it's true and try it out. It's a dynamic way of really exploring uh, spiritual ideas. Then you discover it, it brings you absolute inner certainty of its truth. George, have you always been interested in spiritual things? Oh, no. Oh, no. You see, I was brought up in an agnostic family. Were you? My father, an atheist. We were unbaptized. There were six of us children. One sister who knew about God. Yeah. and felt a bit of a fish about water. 
and um, we never saw the inside of a church. But we were, it, my family was um, socially minded and uh, a tradition of radical politics, historians and the like. <coughs> So it was an interesting setting, but religion played no part in it. Was the, was the famous historian Trevelyan? George Macaulay Trevelyan, he was my uncle. He was your uncle? Yes. Well then, um, we lived in Northumberland. It was not till I was 36 that I got interested in this light, really? in this direction. And that came about through going to a single lecture. It was rather sensational in the sense, I have no doubt that <coughs> Destiny planned this. It looks as if it's a planned event. I was interested in compost. I was in Scotland in 1942. That sounds like a good start. And oh, that's a very good start. I mean, that was typical. Uh, the hair was something very important and uh, <coughs> very much to do with holistic thinking. Yes, indeed. Of course. And that my family had been concerned with. Uh, my Uncle George very much in the, in the founding of the National Trust. And uh, the whole concept of preservation of the life of the planet and all. That so was very high in our yeah, that was all there. And love of mountains and love of nature, etc., etc. But not the spirit. And then, as I say, I was interested in compost <laughs> and heard of um, a centre in Scotland where very interesting things were being done and went to see the man who ran it and found them running a course on Steiner agriculture. And my host was a, a bit annoyed at this young man landing on him when he was busy with the conference. But they said, come along in there. And uh, then they said, well, look here, since George has come, let's get one of the great anthroposophist, Dr. Walter Johannes Stein, and to give us a lecture on what did Dr. Steiner mean by anthroposophy. Goodness. And I, I can remember with an, a room full of 60 people or so, myself right at the back, and Dr. Stein, who was, I know, a great clairvoyant, <clears throat> probably knew exactly what he was about gave this lecture at me, he never looked at me, gave it to the audience, but it was a conversation between him and me mentally. And all the great conceptions of spiritual knowledge of Steiner's anthroposophy came over, one after the other. And uh, my whole being shouted affirmation Man as a spiritual being, yes, yes, obviously, and a droplet of God. Well, of course, of course, clearly. Well, as that, obviously, he was uh, not only there after he dies, but he's pre-existence. He was there before he, before he was born. Yes, marvellous thought. Well, then, where was he educated? Well, obviously, on the earth itself. Earth as a training ground. Yes, 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 how splendid. And then... Well, how old is he then? How often has he been on Earth? You mean reincarnation? Yes. yes. Right back. Oh, marvellous, marvellous. So on. For that whole hour, there was never a m moment of negation. I didn't oh, question amazing. anything. I just, it was all a revelation of a great truth. Came right through like that. Wonderful. So I began reading Steiner avidly, became a pupil of Dr. Lairs, another of the great, great teachers, who was also in Scotland at the time. <clears throat> and, uh, and that started me off. That was in 1942, when I was 36. 
And you've never looked back? Frankly, no. It's gone on. <laughs> the adventure began. And then, uh, had I been a bachelor, I think I would certainly have <clears throat> plunged into Steiner education. But that clearly wasn't to be. But my other, uh, another profound interest was going to be the possibility of using the country house as a cultural center for everybody. And uh, this referred, of course, to my family home, Wallington in Northumberland. But this my father gave to, presented to the National Trust in 1941. It was the first example of a country house being and the state being presented to the nation through the National Trust. It started the fashion, yes. so to speak. Well, rather quixotically, I'd imagine myself using the place for, for courses, even for Steiner courses yes. and the like, yes. with my new enthusiasm. And, um, but again, that therefore was not to be. But destiny working did an extraordinary thing because that door closing at Wallington, it came up at a house in Shropshire at Attingham. A new conception of adult education emerged after the war. Precisely what I'd been dreaming of. Why don't we use our country houses, many of which are in a difficult condition, as cultural centres for anybody with short residential courses. Wonderful idea. Oh, it was marvellous. When everybody was wanting to get back to peacetime interests. So a movement started which produced oh, 25 or 30 colleges in the end. And the fourth of them, 1947, was Attingham Park, the Shropshire Adult College, which I bid for, and uh, was appointed. And so we plunged in, in autumn of 47. And I ran this then for 25 years, until retirement in 1971. How did they take the sort of courses you wanted to run there? Well, uh, or did you have I wanted to run courses on every kind of enthusiasm. It was after the war, we were getting back to peacetime values. Well, I discovered the extremely simple plan, anything that I wanted to know about. <laughs> I knew I could whip up the enthusiasm of people. So I laid on a course, invited the expert to come and talk to us about it, but always made, made my rule to myself. I gave the opening talk even if it was a subject I knew nothing about. Because I felt it was encouraging to people to find you could break into anything. You were not confined to your period or your subject. We were out in that time to widen enthusiasm. So that was wonderful. In a sense, I became Lord Attingham. And, uh, and looking back on it, those right away in the late 50s and in through the 60s, when the outer movement was only beginning to be recognized, these gatherings at Attingham, well, it brought together a lot of people who are now leading yeah. figures in the whole spiritual renaissance that's going on. Yeah. A lot of them met each other at Attingham. Wonderful. It's a wonderful Which is thrilling to look back yes. on. Yes, yes, yes. Did you find the young people came along? Did you have much? Oh, 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 yes. That's a, this is a good drew story. Drew the young along? In one conference, I saw in this filled room, 150 people in the room, at the back was a little row of the flower people, dressed in, the, in all their lovely clothes. They came up afterwards with big round eyes and said, but we didn't know that people in your generation thought like this. 
and uh, this is exciting. And as we talked, the idea came up, well, what about a conference? Marvellous. I give you a course. And they said, well, if you offer us a conference, we'll pack the house. Oh. We'll send the news round in our circles. Was this the sort of hippie time you're talking the about? Hippie the hippie time, the early hippie yeah. time. And so I said, done. And I remember my tutor, who uh, did not approve of my esoteric side, <laughs> was appalled and said, what's the picture of Attingham going to? <laughs> Mysticism for hippies. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I gave him a weekend off. <laughs> and I brought him one or two tutors who I knew loved them, as I did. And they all came, and we had a house full. They arrived, one of them in a caravan, one of them bringing a goat, others chickens, <laughs> dressed all marvellously. They were the most forthcoming group that I've ever had. Really? They were lovely really? people to talk to. And we had a very interesting affair. I began the first lecture to this group saying, well, I don't know you, you don't know me, so I think the best is I'll tell you what I think life is about, what we're here for. So I held forth on it. And at the end I said, well, how far can you go with that? And there was a general response of the whole way. It was very exciting. Then we had the most wonderful weekend <laughs> with groups sitting among the flowers. It was this time of year, the daffodils were out and we sat on the lawns among the daffodils and talked lovely, spiritual knowledge. Lovely. It was terribly exciting. Wonderful. And that, that generation and now the parents of a whole new generation of young. Of course, they? and these younger ones are now going to be at the top of their form at the turn of the century with all the drama of entering the Aquarian age. Yes. But I must say, it may only be the sentiment of an old man, but I am seeing so many young. I look at and I think, well, gosh, how wonderful. Just look at that person. Just look at that child. Yeah. What wonderful yeah. people are coming. Yeah. Brave new world yeah. that has such people in it. And they are coming in with, of course, beginning with the conscious knowledge of the destiny they are taking up and of the world destiny that's coming. This is an enormously important thought. They may forget it. They may get overwhelmed by other things so that they lose it. The interest in the material. But if they come through and are not caught up by either fear or desire for power or all the temptations that drag one down in this age, they know on a deeper level what they're looking for. And therefore the strength of this whole movement is that advanced souls in the shape of young people are in fact rallying to fulfill a destiny that they've seen when they're up there and are now rediscovering when they're down here. Yes. And if we who were earlier in the movement have done anything to offer them the link to wake them up. Prepare the ground. To prepare they? the ground, then it's been very worthwhile. Absolutely. How, did the, how does this fit in with the Rekin Trust? When did that start? Well, I began early, right from the beginning, including certain weekend courses which uh, of spiritual nature and uh, rather tentatively at first you see we were doing mostly weekends for the general public and then midweek conferences um, probably closed bodies of some sort <coughs> and um, i began tentatively touching the spiritual themes and um, and then in a few years, we got bolder at this in the early 50s and through the 50s, and then discovered a remarkable thing, that when I laid on a spiritual course, 
frontiers of reality, death, the great adventure, quest for the grail in our time, that sort of thing. Yes. The house was packed. Goodness. The public really wanted it. And people from all over the country began coming. And this was a little perplexing because my governors and the extramural department who were on the governors from Birmingham University were a bit frightened and very sceptical. Is this valid LLG education? <laughs> I can imagine. But at any rate, the danger and education director said to me, look, George, you must not draw a bad reaction from ratepayers. It'll damage <laughs> the college. But they were in need of funds, and I discovered a line that I could guarantee to fill the house. <clears throat> well, by the early 60s, I was doing half a dozen of these courses a year and a summer school on interpreting the great myths and that kind of thing. And uh, I learnt how to be very diplomatic and careful. And my governors were good enough, they never came. They never snooped to see what happened in these courses. Wonderful things did. Well, by, at the end of my time, I retired in and my time of retirement came in 1971. So we'd run courses in Attingham from 48 to 71. So 71, did you? Yes. And so what I knew then was that I, what I really wanted to do was to start, start an adult education for spiritual knowledge, but not associated with any particular doctrine. Mm. Here already was were many movements, yes. uh, Theosophy, Anthroposophy, Buddhism, TM, uh, several others, uh, putting forward their particular approach. And I felt that what was needed, what people were wanting, was something that didn't con commit them to any particular path, mm. but gave them in general the picture of man as a spiritual being. The spiritual nature of man and the universe. So, freed from Attingham, with the advice of one or two important friends, I conceived the idea of uh, a trust, educational trust, concerned with the spiritual nature of man and the universe. And looking out of the window, I saw my local mountain, the Rekin. And I thought, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Then we called it the Rekin Trust. But then we had no conference house. So we uh, took houses all over the country, up and down the country, and plunged into running, pro running programs of courses, which, well, which still goes on. And it's still alive and flowering in new directions. Wonderful. When do you think, George, that this, this new consciousness really started? Well, the consciousness is ageless, of course. It is, after all, a re-emergence of what's called the ageless wisdom. <clears throat> what they tell us is that actually the great cosmic period of the Dark Age, called the Kali Yuga, ended in the end um, 1880 more or less. We began to pass through it then, which at last made it possible for consciousness to grasp, to widen again and grasp the totality of things, the spiritual nature of things. And then immediately after that emerge, emerges theosophy, anthroposophy, the revival of the Gnostic wisdom, and the perennial philosophy. And as this spread in our generation, what we said before, it at once reflects itself into a lifestyle. This is so important. And this That's is really starting in the, um, after the war, mm. chiefly, the 50s, above all the 60s, the end of the 60s, it was in full blast. And what he does, and the important thing to see is that 
the alternative lifestyle, the holistic vision, the oneness vision, includes our really waking up to the fact that we are truly stewards of the planet and have failed lamentably and culpably in our stewardship. And therefore, remember that all the conservation movements are part of this awakening. Yes. The uh, Greenpeace and Men of the Trees and uh, uh, <coughs> even National Trust and all these and uh, the p impulse for the planting of trees I mean, like and recovering our stewardship, uh, innumerable movements now which don't necessarily need to bother about the spiritual mystique. What Gaia wants is that humanity begins to act as steward and not as exploiter of her wealth. And uh, whether you admit to the, the vision of the spiritual nature of the universe doesn't matter to her so long as we begin to plant trees and stop merely pouring poisons into the planet, into her. Gaia is what, George? Gaia is the name for the Greek conception of the goddess of the earth. And it was revived, not by the mystics, but by the scientists. It was Lovelock who first produced the Gaia hypothesis, as they called it. The concept and I repeat from the scientific end that there is an uncanny intelligence in the earth which knows how to defeat any attack on its essential life. And ultimately Gaia cannot be defeated. And as he claims in his writings, and many others are now following him, it's really in a sense that the totality of Earth has an intelligence, is therefore an intelligent being of which we're part, of which the whole of nature is an expression. And so we're recovering the sense that there is this goddess of the Earth. And we've got to begin thinking this way. George, do you think one of the concepts that we've got wrong, which I don't know how long man has held the concept, but we seem to be taught to look upon the spirit as something totally separate from matter in the West? You've touched the very exciting point of the way of looking at nature and its beauties. We're getting back to the idea of that out of the divine source, the divine mind, pours the great ocean of life and of intelligence, which is God. And that this, in that outpouring of creative intelligence is formed the archetypes of all things that manifest in nature, and that includes man, this creative archetype. The creative archetype of man, and I find this a thrilling notion, is there from the beginning. After all, God says, let us make man after our own image. Male, female made he them. And conceive the first in creation is this great archetype of the human being, a being who can focalize thinking and loving and willing, like unto God. And then the whole thing is pictured, reflected in the beauties of nature, and the crown of evolution then becomes the being the point where the spiritual entity can, that is man, that is I, you can say I, 
can enter this wonderful temple of the body. We aren't our bodies. This is the temple which enables us as an immortal, eternal spiritual being to operate in the heavy density of matter. And so we come down into this temple which in a mysterious way includes the lot. This is so wonderful and so great a subject that uh, this microcosm includes, reflects the whole macrocosm. And therefore we are on to a new way of looking into nature, of looking at the flowers, looking at those great trees looking at the clouds, looking at the birds and the animals, to see them as all part of the great archetype of which we are the picture. And it is for that that millions of years have gone in order to create this extraordinary work of art and design which is man in nature up to the point when he can become as a god, can break through as a friend to God and com creative companion to God. Look, I want to say a little poem or a verse or two of it. It comes to my mind now, for so often it's the poets who can express this thing using the right hemisphere of the brain, the sensitive feminine power. This is Evelyn Notes poem, The Glory Which Is F. Not the whole poem, but enough. Oh, lovely, I'd love to have a poem recited to me. <clears throat> Man treads softly on the earth. What looks like dust is also stuff of which galaxies are made. The green of earth's great trees and simple grasses is the same music played in red throughout our trunks and limbs. O earth, living, breathing, thinking earth, the day we treasure you as you have treasured us, humanness is born. And throughout all life, a radiance leaps from star to star, singing, a sun is born, humanity. You see this tremendous thought that Wonderful poem. throughout all life, the excitement of the heaven world, look, it's happening. And he, she, the human being, is waking up to the fact of what their destiny really is. A radiance leaps from star to star, singing, a sun is born. Humanity, we're being born into our true humanity, or shall we put it this way, humanity really is in a pre-birth condition. And we've reached the point of we, we're going through the imprisonment into body and sense, and breaking through as a member of the total universe of light and spirit, and taking our proud position as a co-creator with God. This is the scale of things now. So I've said so often, there never was such a time to be alive. 